Good morning. I want to welcome you today to our Forest Lake Baptist Church Sunday morning Bible study. I know that our church family is joining us through the connection on our website, www.flbc.us. And we know that our guests, we have some regular guests who attend Bible study with us or who are involved in our community groups or who uh, come to worship every week. And we are delighted to have you with us. And if you are new with us, albeit online, uh, thank you for being here. Our Bible study this morning is from the book of Romans, uh, written, of course, by the Apostle Paul. And so uh, as we uh, are looking in Romans, we're following the curriculum guide that appears in our Explore the Bible series. Uh, your pastors had to settle on how to do this, and we opted for the Explore the Bible series because it basically studies a book of the Bible at a time. And so for those of you that do not have a copy of that study guide, your Sunday school class or community group may be in a different curriculum series. Uh, we opted for this one so that we could direct everyone and encourage everyone to a single book that we will be studying together for the duration of this present discomfort. Now that phrase that I use is a tongue-in-cheek take uh, that I heard many years ago uh, in one of my pastorates. Uh, I pastored the Hickory Baptist Church in Hickory, Mississippi from 1988 until uh, the fall of 1988 until the end of the summer 1991. And one of our ladies in that congregation was a, study, was a student of history, <clears throat> and Miss Hazel commented many times calling something this present discomfort. And I finally said one day, Miss Hazel, Will you tell me the history of that? And she said, well, my mother and father would never refer to uh, the war between the states or the Civil War uh, as anything other than this present discomfort. And so I have adopted that for almost anything that is a trying circumstance in life. And so that is the history of that figure of speech that you'll hear Rick, Rick use occasionally. And, and so for the duration of this present discomfort, we're going to be speaking to you by video feed on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. And then again for our worship service on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings, uh, our midweek services will be presented at 6 p.m. Uh, on the website as you're finding this. And then periodically, we will do ministry updates that uh, the pastors and staff will do those uh, and we will publicize those when they occur. Now this morning as we look at the book of Romans, I'm going to read first from the passage, and if you have a Bible, please follow along with me. There's we read. I'll be reading from the New International Version, and so uh, what, whichever particular translation that you are reading, please just follow along. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? And if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation." You know, the desire for peace is universal, but it also seems that the presence of conflict is inevitable. 
There's a southern piece of wisdom that I've heard and you've heard and that you may have seen in a, uh, a store at different places. Little placards that hang on the wall have these sayings on them and this one goes this way. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Well, by inference, we can reason that if mama is happy, then everybody's happy. Mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Mama is happy, everybody's happy. I understand that. Uh, in our home growing up, uh, my dad uh, had my brother and I psychologically in such a position that we were just slightly scared of him and he liked it that way. Well, we were just a little bit scared of dad, but we were terrified of mom. Now, my mother was easygoing and loved us and, and just one of the most peaceable people that you would ever want to meet. But we knew that she had her limits and we knew not to even push near those limits. And so we all have an understanding of happiness in a relationship and peace in a relationship. And we all have an understanding of what it's like to have tension in a relationship. And I don't know that my mother and I ever had a serious argument, uh, but I can tell you up front, if we had, I would have lost because she was by far smarter than I. But I did not want tension in our relationship. Uh, we were free to express our opinion uh, and grew up being taught to think for ourselves and make do for ourselves, as we sometimes say, but we did not want tension in those vital relationships. And so when we read this passage in Romans, we need to understand that the Lord Himself has done those things necessary for us to be at peace with Him. Paul goes further uh, when he explains it this way. He says, therefore. Now anytime the Apostle Paul says, therefore, we need to take note because he is about to explain something to us that has a direct application to our life and our relationship with God or a direct application to our life and our relationship with other people. When he says, therefore, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he is actually making reference to everything that he just said from Romans 1, verse 1, up to this point in the concluding verse of chapter 4, uh, which is found in the 25th verse. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. There's a lot in that verse that we can unpack, but there are a couple of applications that we will make for the purposes of this Bible study uh, as we look at it this morning. The first one is to note that our world is not at peace. Uh, there's a Old Testament reference, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah said on two different occasions, peace, peace, but there is no peace. He was making reference to those who declared peace and everything being just wonderful in the midst of what was obviously a very conflicted world. And so we need to understand that uh, peace as a state of harmony in relationships or as a state of harmony among nations has always been a desirable goal or an aspirational goal, but it has not always been an experiential life or something that we experience as we live daily life uh, as we just walk with the Lord. And so we understand that when we look around in the world, when we read the newspapers, when we read the media, uh, or observe the media as we find it on television, it seems like every day there is some new atrocity that we have heard of. And so we look around and we know there are those who say peace, peace, but there is no peace. But in the midst of that, there is a reality of peace that is made possible through faith in God. Inevitably, when I've been in circumstances where there were conflict, uh, there was conflict, I find that there are people who are at peace even though the circumstances around them are in chaos. And so I've wondered occasionally, how are those people at peace in the midst of all this? Uh, my goal personally as an individual Christian and as a pastor in a local church has been to have peace in the midst of every circumstance. And so how does that happen? Well, what Paul tells us here is it happens through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Lord has made possible peace as a result of faith in Christ. 
Here's what transpired. We go back to the beginning of human history as we find it revealed in the Bible. And we know there was a man and a woman named Adam and Eve who rebelled in their relationship with God. And as a result of their rebellion, their sin, the, all of mankind was separated from God and the sin principle passed into all humanity as history progressed. And with that sin principle came with it the potential for every person to be at war with another person. And so the other side of that is that because of the sin that was within every person, every person was separated from God. And so we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're all made right with God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we read this verse, or this passage, we understand that wrath was satisfied at the cross. In verse 6, Paul says this, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. What that means to each of us is that even before we knew that there was a God in heaven who revealed himself on this earth in the person of Jesus Christ, the Lord was already doing his work to create peace in our relationship with him. And he did that as his wrath was satisfied at the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a story I tell pretty often about when I was, oh, I don't know, fifth grade, I think. Probably fifth grade. Uh, yes, it was fifth grade because if it had been the fourth grade, I'd have been dead because my teacher in the fourth grade would have made sure I didn't survive this. But some of you who watch this may remember uh, some of this. One day in school, some of the guys were engaged in a friendly little uh, alteration called a rock fight. Now this was all in good fun. We didn't intend for anybody to get hurt. We certainly didn't intend for the building to be damaged, but one of my uh, rocks went astray, went right through the window in one of the teacher's classes. And so I was horrified. Well, it was like every child in that classroom immediately appeared at the window and this girl says, that one with the white hat did it. I don't remember what color hat I was wearing, but you get the idea, I was wearing a baseball cap. and. Evidently, she wasn't paying attention to the teacher. She was watching what was going on outside. But all that, all, all outside. But all that aside, uh, the price of that window was two dollars. So I go to the principal's office. You know, I get the verdict. If you bring two dollars, then you know we'll call it clean. And so that night, I went to basketball practice, and my coach, uh, so he was a young guy. Uh, he's probably 30 years old at that time. When I was in the fifth grade, I thought 30 was ancient. But at any rate, I was in a glum mood. He says, what's going on? So I told him about the rock in the wind episode and that I was the only one in trouble because of our rock fight on the schoolyard. And so he said, man, that's tough. Well, I got out of the car that night, started walking up my driveway where we lived, and I heard him say something. He said, hey, I've got something for you. And he threw something out the window and drove off. And I walked back down to see what he threw out the window and I unfolded it. It was two $1 bills. I was so happy. I didn't have two dollar bills. I hadn't told my dad or my mom about this. The next day I went to the principal's office at the University Place School and I put my two dollars on that principal's desk and her wrath had been satisfied. And there's a principle there that we need to pay attention to that the Lord did for us in Christ what we could not do for ourselves. His wrath was satisfied at the cross of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, his love was demonstrated at the cross of Jesus Christ. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though some for a good person might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who loves you that much? Who loves me that much? Well, we could look around and gauge the relationships that we have the people around us. And there may be some around us who would, as the scripture says, dare to die for us. In fact, I know many parents who would willingly give their life for their children. I know spouses who would give their life for their spouse. Uh, and so 
love, that kind of love is possible, but the scripture reminds us that while we were still unlovable, while we were still ungodly, Christ died for us. And so God's wrath was satisfied at the cross, but Jesus demonstrated God's love for us, us at the cross. And because of that, justification was made possible through Jesus' death. The idea of justification is to be made right in terms of our standing before the law. Similar to my window illustration, uh, there's that thing we deal with in America uh, where we pay parking tickets. Now, I'm not going to go into anybody else's business about parking tickets, but I'll tell you a time or two, I've, I've had a parking ticket. I paid my ticket. And as long as I paid that ticket, uh, it was the right thing to do. The police department was satisfied and everything's clean. Now, if you go so far in the eyes of the law in terms of parking tickets, you can have, uh, you can be summoned to court or you can have your car confiscated. There are different things that can happen. But you understand the principle that if we get that $2 parking ticket or that $10 parking ticket, in fact, it's been so long, I have no idea what a parking ticket cost at this time. But if we get that ticket, and we pay that price, justification occurs in the eyes of the law. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the penalty of our sin was paid in the eyes of God the Father. And we were made righteous according to the new law, the law of grace. And so we are justified by faith through the blood of Jesus Christ. We look to God because of the blood of Christ. We stand justified by faith in the eyes of God because of the blood of Christ. But there's something else that occurs in that, and that is this matter of reconciliation. And this is where we get to the matter of peace. You see, we could have the price paid, but still not have a sense of peace in the relationship or have a sense of peace in the relationships around us. Uh, because peace is that sense of harmony and wholeness in the relationship. The word salvation, as we find it in the New Testament, uh, essentially means to be made whole. Uh, it means also to be saved from destruction or to be redeemed from the trash heap of history. And this idea of peace with God is akin to the uh, idea of salvation as we experience it in our relationship with Him. And so the scripture reminds us of this. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Something I heard many years ago from another teacher was the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is unilateral. The scripture says that the Lord has forgiven us. The idea means to let go, that we were holding on to something and we let it go when we forgave it. And the idea in our human relationships is similar, that when we forgive someone, we let go of our part of the enmity that is between us. Now, forgiving another person does not mean that what they did somehow is no longer wrong. In fact, there are some things that people do that are very wrong, and our forgiving them uh, does not in any way erase the wrongness of their action. But what it does do is it releases us of the power that it holds over us. And so when we forgive, we let go and we release ourself even as we release the other person. So forgiveness is unilateral. It is a one-way transaction of the soul and the will as we let go of that which we have held on to. By the same token, reconciliation is bilateral. Uh, bilateral is a two-way type of relationship. And so whereas forgiveness is commanded in the scriptures and we can forgive someone whether they ever acknowledge they are wrong or not, 
when we are reconciled to another person, it happens because the other person will have acknowledged their part of the enmity that exists and they will do their part in rebuilding a mutually beneficial relationship through acts of goodwill. Now, in our human relationships, that is very needed. For reconciliation to occur, there must be mutual forgiveness and there must be mutual acts of goodwill to demonstrate the type of character and commitment and heart that is necessary to restore that relationship. In our relationship with God, there's nothing we can do to make up the difference in terms of what is needed. We can only accept the forgiveness that He offers to us, the peace that He announces to, the in, to all of humanity, to all of creation through the work of Christ. We can accept that and we benefit from that when we come to Him in faith. But the reconciliation that works out in our life is first when we recognize that we have a relationship with Him that nothing or no one can damage. And secondly, when we recognize that we are called upon to be reconciled to those around us in so far as we can. And so the basis of peace between individuals who are in conflict or families who are in conflict or nations who are in conflict is not found in peace at the point of the sword or peace in terms of power of one over the other, but peace on mutual terms of respect found in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many times we think of peace in personal terms as everybody does it my way. And my, my most humorous memory of something like this was when I first got to the Holt Baptist Church in the summer of 2010, there was a Thursday morning Bible study group called Thursday Morning Live. It was mostly senior adults. At that time, there were 18 or 20 of them that met each week. And we had a morning devotional and shared prayer request and then ate brunch. And then some of them stayed uh, for games and dominoes, cars, things like that. Well, when I hadn't been there very long, I asked how long, you know, just new pastor finding out the history of the particular group and how they came together and why they were there. And so we decided, okay, once a month, we're going to go somewhere else to eat. And then we decided, well, all right, after the first time we went somewhere to eat, uh, we decided we'd expand that. We'd include some other activities. And so one day a big discussion broke out. And I'm just listening, uh, which is, you know, get on a high rock somewhere and listen is often the best or the better part of judgment or wisdom when we're in that type of situation. So I'm just listening as the new pastor and wondering how they're going to work this out. Are we going to go to Barn Hills in Columbus, Mississippi? Are we going to go to Cracker Barrel in Tuscaloosa? Are we going to go somewhere else and take a look at something, some tourist attraction? And one of the older fellows in the group uh, that was there at that time, a man named Trice Ayers, and, and Tri said, wait a minute, wait a minute, he'd been a coach. And he did a timeout sign. And he said, I've got an idea. He said, there is no need in us arguing about this. We'll just all do it my way. And so in a moment, everybody laughed at the silliness of the discussion over in the posturing. And let's do this or do that over which way to go. They did not decide to do it the way Trice wanted to do it. But the, the tension did ratchet down a little bit and we laid out a schedule in the coming months to where we would go different places. And so we took ideas and we worked on that and it worked really well and it became a lot of fun. But as I've thought about that over the years, so often we think of peace in personal terms. And Trice kind of summed it up in the way that we think of certain things when he said, oh listen, there's no need to argue about this, we'll just do it my way. Well, if there's going to truly be peace among those who claim the name of Christ, and if there's going to truly be peace in our communities and in our churches, if there's the need to deal with some conflict or something like that, if there's going to truly be peace, it can't be peace on anyone's terms other than the terms of the gospel. And so Paul reminds us that spiritual peace with God is the foundation of peace in every other arena as it impacts our hearts and lives. And that peace is made possible through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you again for joining us this morning. 
I know, of course, that this is a one-way discussion, but what I want to encourage you to do is at home, where you are now, with family, uh, or on the telephone, or if you text, do this however you want to, but I want to encourage you to take up a discussion of Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, with your friends and your circle of contacts that you're communicating with during this shutdown, this weird experience we're in right now, this present discomfort, as I'm calling it, and go to that scripture and ask those around you, how has the peace of God through Jesus Christ impacted your health or impacted your family or your workplace or your network of relationships, your recreation uh, in life? How does God's peace take shape in your life as an individual and in your family and the lives of those around you? And when you answer that question, you have begun to apply what Paul calls us to in this passage. Thank you again so much for being with us today. We will see you in just a few moments for morning worship.